All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. This is Shillfish from whatsbossfire.com. Uh, it's a site that's not out yet, but community-driven site. It'll be out eventually. Yada, yada. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about video game narrations and stories. And I brought two special guests with me today. I'm going to introduce them here. I got Oliver. Hello. Hey, Oliver. So, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, Oliver? Uh, I'm a former game journalist. Uh, I worked for EO Gamer, or wrote for EO Gamer, and uh, Hard for Games uh, pretty much throughout 2009 up through 2011. Um, I did take some time off because I, I wanted to focus on getting a couple of books written, and then I kind of had a health crisis, and I've just been out of the, out of the general loop for a little bit. Um, I, as far as writing, just storytelling goes, um, I focus on no particular genre in question. Uh, it doesn't matter if I think there's an interesting story to tell in a particular space, then I'm just going to jump right in there and do that. Um, I've been playing video games since I was, you know, a little kid, just like pretty much any other hardcore gamer. I've got like 25 years under my belt, and I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. No. I mean, not unless the entire industry crashes completely. But no, that's cool. So you used to be a journalist, and then you dropped out to do your own thing? No, I just, you know, I was like, well, I need to take a couple of months off. And then I had like a series of back-to-back -back medical crises, it's like all the worst things that could happen to you medically basically just dogpiled on top of my head. And I've spent the past uh, two years just trying to regain my health and get back in the game. And it seems like that's going to be coming up here pretty soon. Oh, boy. Well, I hope things uh, go well for you. And uh, also with us, we have Words. It's at Wordsmith, missing, missing some letters. So why don't you go ahead and say hi. Um, hi. Um, yeah, like you said, I'm Words. Uh, I'm a student studying English Lit and Psychology. I am working on a visual novel project with my team, uh, Red Ink. Um, and just in general, I'm a, I'm a hopeful indie game designer. Um, I don't, haven't really been doing it for very long, but... Hopefully I can. Well, we're all we're all newbies at some point. Um, I'm Shellfish. I'm the host. Definitelyspellsfire.com. Yada yada. I'm a student also. I'm hoping to go into tech writing major. So, but anyway, let's get started. Video games and stories. Now, I had a stream before, and I had someone from the opposite camp who was very much on the belief that stories don't really contribute much to a game. That they kind of just get in the way of gameplay and. It's really more about gameplay more than the story. You guys agree with that or what? I say it depends on the game. Well, I absolutely disagree. Video or just storytelling in video games is not just kind of important. It's probably one of the most important things that's just happened in the entertainment medium in a couple of decades. Mhm. Mm and definitely. Uh, yeah. If it's it's easy to look at games and think, "Oh, they're supposed to be this series of rigorous like like simple mechanics because that's what they were originally but you don't think about like the uh like graphic adventure games which came along a little bit later um and then text adventure games where it was a much more focus on the the story and the uh context rather than the systems in place yeah definitely i agree with the the sentiment too that i mean stories definitely matter in games i mean i believe you need gameplay to make it a video game more or less but, yeah. I mean, a lot of people like to cite these old um, early Nintendo games or even earlier than that, like, with fucking Pong and shit. And, by the way, you guys can swear I don't give a damn. And they like to say, well, these games really didn't have story and they didn't need them. It's all about gameplay since the beginning. But, you know, there's also MUDs. There's, uh, I mean, anything pretty much released on the computer. All the old computer RPGs, yeah. wireframe dungeons and all that. Yeah, so I, I agree with that too. And just just in general, like when you the the first thing that comes to mind when you say Nintendo isn't necessarily oh the the Zelda's a dungeon crawler or Mario is a two D platform. The first first thing that comes to your mind when you think of Nintendo is you think of their characters. So I think that kind of speaks to how important that is. Definitely. I mean, there's. I mean, yeah, they want their characters to stand out graphically, but to have a character stand out is to you know give them a personality or you know, some sort of element of storytelling. <laughs> Even if it's something as ludicrous as, well, he's a plumber, I guess. Absolutely. 
Okay. So what kind of games do you guys uh, personally enjoy? Or what do you think uh, stories serve best, other than RPGs, since I assume that's the go-to answer? I'm uh, just, in general, I'm genre agnostic. It doesn't matter to me. If the game looks interesting, I'll play it. That's just what it comes down to. I kind of feel the same way. But um, I guess in terms of stories specifically, uh, most of my favorite stories have come from point-click adventures. Oh yeah? Certain ones? Um, my favorite game of all time is The Longest Journey by uh, Funcom and Ragnar Turnquist. And if you and stuff more recently, if you've ever played like a Wajedi game, those are fantastic. That's another adventure game? Uh, yeah, it's a studio. Uh, they've made uh, Primordia and like Gemini Ru and uh, Shiva, a couple others. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's we've seen the research of the adventure genre. And that's where, again, I, I can't buy into this. I mean, people have personal preferences, so if they want to say, well, it's all about gameplay, that's fine. But there's definitely a reality of stories are super important in video games, and I think you need no look further than with the resurgence of the adventure genre as a whole. Yeah, I'd like to reiterate something that um, this whatever fifty four guy said here. He said uh, a good Go story. Uh, he said a good story will make any genre better, but some genres need a story a lot less than others. And um, to like expand on that a little bit, it's it it, it it's very true. Uh, it it just depends on the genre and the, what the the creator is going for. Some games, the uh, context and all the uh, extra like assets work towards making the systems more enjoyable and sometimes the systems reinforce the context. Definitely. What do you think um what's your perfect balance between a like a story and a game for you two? Like if you had to say would you favor a lot more detail on the story and less on the gameplay, kind of like a 50-50? I'd say 50-50 is about, right? I mean, it it's it's all situational. It depends on what kind type of game you're trying to make and what kind of story you're trying to tell. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to just give a definitive answer on that. Um, the the thing with games is that it's unlike a a book, for example. A book is pretty much read in more or less the same way. You open the book, flip through pages. You know, you go through the text, and the story unfolds however they decided to unfold it. But because video games are such an eclectic medium, you can tell a story in all kinds of different ways. You can do a classic point and click, and you can reveal your narrative through exploring the environment. Or you can you can play something like Dragon Age, where the story is kind of you know, revealed to you mostly through dialogue. Or you know, playing an FPS, where maybe you'll just pick up like message logs or things like that, like say, I don't know, like Dead Space or whatever, you know, so it really, really depends on what type of game you're working with. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing about video games is there's a slew of methods to deliver your story, the way you're saying, through audio logs, um, kind of like uh, with Mass Effect, the whole, you pick up lore, pick up little writing samples they can read about on your own free time. You know, there are some that are more engaging than others, but there's a whole bunch of ways to deliver story. Uh, personally, I, I enjoy the uh, audio log idea. I think it's always interesting having the character or hearing the character's final moments. That's what it's always. That's what it always is, isn't it? Like the character's about to die. He's like, man. By the way, if you need the code, it's eight four seven eight. Just hear him die. Right, <laughs> and it's a little weird when you do that, you know. And again, it also comes down to the creator of the content, too. They might introduce the narrative to you in ways that are completely unexpected and will stick in your memory forever. I mean, look at uh, original Metal Gear Solid, right? And, you know, you have to get the code for that codec number on the back of the actual case. Like, that caught people off guard. People are still talking about that, and that happened well over a decade ago. You know, it's just different things like that. I mean, there's so many different ways to capture the audience with video game storytelling that it's just, it's incredible. Yeah, it, it definitely opens the, uh, the door for a just unfathomable, unfathomable number of uh, ideas and 
ways to go about it. It's it's nuts. Yeah, it's definitely enjoyable, and it helps. Anything that helps you bring you more into the game, you know, is great on my stretch of imagination. I mean, stories just as important as trying to create an environment that looks or feels or sounds believable. So if story can also reinforce that, that's that's great. Do you guys have a preferred method of delivery of story when it comes to video games? Mm, that's a tricky uh, question. I don't know that I can say I have a preferred way overall, but I'm I'm particularly in love with the way Dark Souls went about it and, and Demon Souls, where it's all like very on like the fringe of what you're doing and you just get most of the 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 lore through uh, item descriptions and just really vague comments from NPCs. Yeah, the Soul series did a great job of of putting the story there, but they made you, if you really wanted that story, you needed to go looking for it. And so it was kind of an interesting mix between, for people who don't care about story, they'll just kind of dismiss it offhand. You know, they're just like, well, I want to play a game and it might be a hard game and they'll just go through it. But so many people became so invested in that narrative. It, it, it's kind of amazing because, again, they did something that most people had never really attempted before. Uh, just me in general, I, I, I usually like to see story unfold organically. You know, just, or no, I take that back. Not so much organically, it's just with you know npcs and whatnot kind of filling you in as you go if it's a cutscene or if it's during live gameplay it doesn't matter that too much to me do you do you agree with the idea that something like cutscenes kind of robs the game of gameplay not necessarily um i think it's i think cutscenes are still kind of you know even though we've been doing them for a long while they're still kind of experimental in that sense um, I don't really hold it against the game industry for doing them. Um, it can, it, it for storytelling purposes, it does allow them to put together complex sequences that may be more difficult to program, you know, as far as the, the player being involved in that sequence. Or it's it's too complex of an idea or it would take too much time to put into reality, whereas they can say, well, you know what, we can just kind of show them what's going on. Like, it makes me think of... Uh, Final Fantasy Seven, you know some of the 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 cutscenes developing in there, such as the uh, the Mako cannon firing. There's not really a good way to gameplay that, you know. It's just like, okay, yeah, you could have put it in there, but it was easier to just kind of render it, get the point across, and then get people back to the game. Yeah, I agree. It's Absolutely. it's a little ham fisted at times. Well, I mean, whenever it takes the uh, cutscene, the cutscene just takes away full control completely. It is. Right. Um. So I agree with that. It's a little, I get, quote, artificial and ham-fisted, but I get definitely see the uses for it. And if it's a good cutscene, I'm appreciative of it. And it is good to be able to break up intense gameplay like that if it goes on for too long, because otherwise you're just going to water down the gameplay experience itself. Right. Uh, what do you think, Wordsmith? You think... Uh... Um... I agree mostly. I guess maybe just to expand on that, the experimental nature of cutscenes is is why while a lot of people or a lot of us, I, I have too definitely uh, poked fun at QTEs. Like their 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 original purpose was to hopefully bridge that gap in in some sense. And whether that's been successful or not, I think it depends on your perspective. What do you think it? didn't do well. What game do you think did it horribly, if there is one you can think of? Um, hmm. I think it was <laughs> I think it was Spider-Man 2. It was it was a PS2 game, I think. Mm -hmm. That that uh that just it was just a, it just made for the silliest things. Just like you you completely fail a a QTE and he like slips on a banana peel and it's just <laughs> It, it just completely takes you out of it. <laughs> um, an example for me would have to be Eternal Sonata. Um, some of the cutscenes are good, but there's one cutscene in particular where a character is dying and she takes upwards of 10 minutes to actually die. And it's really ridiculous and it definitely takes you away from even <laughs> emphasizing it all or, or having any sort of empathy with the game. 
Yeah. So there's definitely games that do it. Eternal wrong. Sonata is a, a Japanese game, right? It's a, a JRPG. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. I, that's just. I think that maybe is it, it could in some cases just be a, a difference of like uh, uh, tastes because uh, a Japanese person might look at that and be like, oh, that's fine because they kind of lean on the the melodramatic pretty heavily. Uh, I don't know in the case of Eternal Sonata, I've never played it, but um, just saying. No, no, that's fine. And, you know, and that's for the whole. Like, go ahead. I was gonna say, you know, there there are plenty of games that do that wrong or kind of unnecessarily, like you're talking about. Um, I've found many QTs to be kind of pointless in things like boss battles. That's where we see it more often than anything else these days. I would say, uh, like in Castlevania: Lords of Shadow, or you know, seeing it happen in God of War and things like that. But then there are times when it was done right, like. I don't like seeing a QT show up when it's going to always end to a direct uh, conclusion, such as, oh, okay, you climb up on a boss, and or you've hit a, a, a milestone in the fight where this pre-rendered thing is going to play out, and you're doing all this cool shit, and you got to mash this button or tw- you know, tilt the stick in this direction or whatever. You could have just saved it. Like it's kind of it, it, it's cheap there. But then you sit down and you play something like Shenmue, where if you fail a QTE, it's not the end of the game. It just means that the story kind of dovetails in a, in a different way. Um, one of the QTEs in Shenmue has you, uh, I think it was, God, I haven't played that in years, um, where you're going to find a guy in a tattoo parlor or whatever. Or, no, actually, let me take that back. There's a particular one. There's the one with the barber shop. Okay, and you go in there, and you're you know you're trying to find the 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 old uh, classic professions, and one of them is a barber, and you, you sit down in the chair, and he tells you don't move, and they trick you with that QT where he puts a razor to your neck, and he does it super fast, and you've been trained to kind of react to those QTs, and you fail out, and he's like, no, you're not patient enough, come back tomorrow, and so you kind of slow down the story in that aspect. Or if you fail certain QTs in the game too much, you close off a potential avenue to completing the game. There are other ways around it, but it, it, it really made it interesting to see how players react to that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. yeah absolutely. Um, I feel QTs follow the same manner. of They're a bit artificial. And sometimes it's, the unfortunate thing is it feels like with a lot of games such as adventure games or um man i'd have to look up the game where that's the only way of actually conveying gameplay that isn't just clicking and going to a certain pixel right what do you mean does that make sense uh you mean just like an adventure game where it's just pretty much all qtes yeah yeah yeah. because there's no actual for the most part there's no actual kind of gameplay base isn't isn't that kind of like how the the Telltale game Telltale games are now? Uh, I haven't played the some of the most recent ones, but I believe that's. I mean, the Telltale games have a lot of QTs in them, don't they? Yeah, like the the Walking Dead and the 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 uh, Wolf Among Us are both heavily QTE based, and they don't. Yeah. As far as I can tell, they don't suffer for it. Like I played through all of the Wolf Among Us, and it was uh, great. It was, it, it peered out towards the end, but just overall, it was a great experience, and uh, it, it added a lot to the experience. Uh, having all these these things play out on screen, and you having to react to them, just with just press X, press Y. Oh crap! I'm messed up. He, <laughs> a lot of people will hate those. Um, it it when it when it works with it like in like the the the. It, it, I mean, when there's all, when that's all there is, it, it works. I guess I, I'm having a hard time finding the words to describe what I'm thinking about it, but it just, it, it comes together really well. Um, l- l- let me try. Let uh, me try. I think uh, kind of what he's getting at is that QTE works well with it, with games that are you know heavily pre-scripted sequences and things like that. It does a good job of giving the player back agency by saying even though this, there's a series of things happening that you aren't necessarily in direct control of, it gives a little bit of that control back while at the same time letting those events unfold as the designer intended. Uh, 
to talk about Wolf Among Us, which I agree was fantastic. Um, it's like when you're going to fight uh, the Jersey Devil, and you've got you know you've got this fight going down. You guys are knocking each other's heads in, but then there are all these different options of what you can crack his head open with, uh, things like that. So it 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 puts you back in control. It's like, well, yeah, this fight is happening, but and you're not really directly in control of it, but you actually are getting a significant portion of that control back. And so with Telltale's recent games, I think that's why, one of the reasons why people aren't complaining about the QTEs is that even in those QTEs, it matters. It's just that they're, it's more of them helping you along through a very rapid series of events. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it's a sense of urgency to the events playing out through a gameplay or through actually pushing buttons and stuff. As opposed to just sitting and watching it all unfold. Right, because we know that they could just yank all the gameplay out of Walking Dead and just watch it like a movie, and that would work. So there's, there's got to be stuff they put back yeah. in to make sure that the player feels like they're actually playing a game instead of just observing the game. Exactly. Okay, I can see that. I agree with that. Um, yeah, I don't really mind QTs myself. It's but it definitely needs to be uh, it needs to have meaning or if, a game that is cinematic focused, I should say. And even then, some games have pushed it a bit too far. Yeah. Um, what games yeah. do you? Th- no, oh, I was up, just agreeing dog? with you. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, what games do you think? Uh, do you guys think had excellent stories? And why? You can go ahead first if you want to. Uh, well, I need to think. I I don't know. I'm kind of stuck on Dark Souls right now. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I recently just I'm not done with it yet, but I uh, I played through this game, the Never Ending Nightmares. It came out here just recently. Uh, full disclosure. Is that the DLC? No, 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 no. That's for Dark Souls. I'm talking for a different game now. Uh, this is. Uh, oh, okay. Never Ending Nightmares is a uh, graphic adventure game by uh, Matt Gilgenbach. And full disclosure, I did back it on Kickstarter, so I am I am biased. Uh, but it's just it's just a horror game, and it 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 deals a lot in it's just like a graphic horror game and it deals a lot in the the uh like it just like makes things abstract because it, it's very much lives up to its name it's just a nightmare and it's a series of events and there's all these these uh you're just you're it's a lot of you just walking around and you can even play it with one hand and just oh watch yeah these things play out in front of you and it, there's there's a lot of things that come into it just in the 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 in the art and the series of events that just just touch on things that are very deep paranoias of the creator and it was just it was really interesting to to see those play out and i don't think it's for everybody i I know a lot of people are going to play look at it and be like what is this garbage i'm not interested in this but it was just it was really interesting to me to see him uh articulate his his paranoia like that and in some cases very literally depict them, uh, what he, uh, his urges and stuff. It was really nuts. All right. No, it's, uh, you look, you like, do you think horror games generally have the kind of best stories? Um, not particularly. Uh, I mean, it, it, you look at things like Silent Hill 2, and that that was great. It just kind of like, it, it, it balances the bridge between, um, between a coherent story and just total ab- abstraction, and uh, that makes things interesting to talk about. Uh, but in the specific case of horror games, not so much. Oftentimes, the scariest parts of those games are like the first half, and when things actually start happening, it become it becomes kind of boring. Yeah, when you see the you see the big yeah. evil guy or the spooky, yeah. Yeah, like everybody scary. remembers the first. Uh, hour of uh, Amnesia the the best, I think. Hmm. 
Yeah, but definitely. I'm like I said earlier, my my favorite game of all time is uh, The Longest Journey, and that's specifically because of the story. It's just a really rich, rich, rich story game. I'd have to play that one. It sounds it's good, though. really long. <laughs> um, I think I tried playing. Uh, is that the first one? This is the first one? one. I didn't much care for Dreamfall as okay. much, but hopefully the the newest one coming out is is all right. Yeah, I tried playing Dreamfall for a little bit, and it seemed interesting. But the first game definitely seemed fantastic. Yep. Did you have a choice? Of oh game man, I mean, there are tons of games. I mean, basically, it's it's more like a, ask me what genre do you think I I think is the best story, and then I'll be able to give you an answer. I mean, there are so many different stories that have been told over the past couple of decades, and I mean, if you were to just flat out say, hey, what is the best game narrative ever created, I'm just going to go back to a classic. I'm going to go back to Chrono Trigger. Like, I think it's... Chrono Trigger was entertaining. I think entertaining. it's just the most cohesive story uh, with, an, uh, with a ridiculous number of branches to be split. Uh, there are still, you know, little tweaks that you can make to that narrative to customize how it ends for you. And even then, it's, it's kind of a question of well, what is canonical? What is the best ending? Um, I think the reason that Chrono Trigger is probably the, the tip-top story pulled in gaming simply because they took a rather complex concept. Time travel is very, very difficult to work with in the narrative space, and they boiled it down in a way that most people can understand. People understand the idea of, I wish I could go back and do things over again. And so Chrono Trigger kind of took that and they ran with that and they just kind of showed us a, po a possible future. Um, it was a great way for the people at the time who played Chrono Trigger initially, you know, the, the main characters were in their same age group. And so a lot of people were very easily able to identify with the cast. Uh, you know, even though there's not any quote unquote minorities in there, it doesn't matter. Everyone could find a character who's... Uh, their personal ideals, their convictions that they could identify with. And if you couldn't find a character that was like that, well, that's what Chrono was for. He, he was a, a voiceless protagonist. He was just there to represent you and how you interact with things. And they covered a lot of complex ideals in that story, too. I mean, there's not just the, the problem of time travel. It's, it's also dealing with things like some decisions don't need to be made over again or shouldn't be made over again. It deals with the concept of, you know, power corrupting. Um, it, it talks about how pride cometh before a fall. It deals with uh, external threats that people aren't aware of that are going to turn around and bite you in your ass when you're not paying attention. I mean, you could just go on and on about that. They, they talk about the nature of parents and relationship to their children it deals with interests of love it gets into science it touches on all these different things but it does so in a way that doesn't feel cheap and it's definitely not pandering it's just it so happens that all these different things touch that core narrative yeah it's there's a lot of genuine it's it's genuine it's not very like in your face with all these you know, subtle meanings, like take a Robo, for example. I mean, just his storyline, it's very much, you know, to me, touches on that kind of whole parent right. thing in a way. Even though he's, right. he's a robot. And just, it was genius at the time, way ahead of its time, and I agree with you completely. Make it... Fantastic story. And uh, normally I hate time travel in video games. I always think it just boils down to some lame ending, like... In a lot of games, it's just like, oh, well, there's time travel. So we kind of just fucked over everything else that was in the game already because now anything's possible. And now, instead of asking what the story about was about, you're kind of asking, how the hell does time travel even work? Whereas Chrono Trigger addressed it early, you know, it wasn't 100% like... At the end of the day, I was appreciative that it was an adventure about time travel. And I wasn't left with what the fuck is time? How the fuck does time travel even work? Right, if that no, makes sense. Uh, there's a there's a way that I used to explain that why Chrono Trigger works for people. It it functions the same way that that Back to the Future and Looper function. 
They basically show up and tell you that they have no clue how this works, so stop thinking so hard about it and just go and enjoy it. And that kind of works. Right, yeah, just like, enjoy you know, else. he's like, hey, I don't want to talk about time travel, because if we do, we'll get into a long discussion, we'll start making diagrams of straws, it doesn't matter, it's, it's irrelevant, just know that time travel is happening, and it's creating a problem, get in there and fix it. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a suspense of disbelief needed, but the games like with Bioshock Infinite, and I, I bring in parallel universes into the same whole time travel nonsense, when they kind of just reveal that at the end, it's it felt disingenuous you know, to me. I I sat down and played Bioshock Infinite, and I'm not a person who likes Bioshock at all, and that's probably going to make people like climb the walls. But I just do not care for the series. But uh, a couple of months ago, I managed to snatch it up on PlayStation Plus, and I was like, well, hell, I'll play almost anything for free. So I sat down and played Infinite, and I was glad because I didn't really need to play the other two to fully grasp the story. And don't get me wrong, I played through, like, probably halfway through the first Bioshock, and then I was just got annoyed. Um, but with Bioshock Infinite, part of the problem with that narrative is that parallel worlds and time travel are difficult. They are freaking difficult for your average person to understand. Like, that just happens to me the genre that I love the most. And so it was easy for me to kind of get in there and, and see how that worked. But so much of that content could go right over people's heads so fast because you're talking about a one, you're talking about a completely hypothetical thing. Like we don't know if time travel actually exists. We think it might exist. We don't know if parallel worlds actually exist. We think they might exist. When you're working with story, it's it's really easy to tell someone whether or something is made up or not and to, as you said, engage in uh, suspension of disbelief. Like you're playing, you know, one of the Mana series right now. Okay. For the most part, everyone knows that magic isn't real. You suspend your disbelief because you know that that's not real. And so you're able to just easily go, hey, a guy's shooting a fireball out of his hands. Or, you know, there are dryads and, and other sort of shit running around. That's really easy. But when you're dealing with a theoretical, a hypothetical concept, such as parallel worlds and time travel, and because there are so many paradoxes and problems, it's hard for the average person to just sort that stuff out. You know, how one person approaches time travel in a story isn't necessarily the same that everyone else is going to do it. Bioshock Infinite puts out the idea of going back in time and doing uh, the, you know, parallel universe thing. Uh, Chrono Trigger, or not Chrono Trigger, just the Chrono series period, Chrono Cross also deals with the concept of a parallel world. Um, Bioshock Infinite made it very complicated for people to get and wrap their minds around. Whereas in Chrono Cross, they just said, here's the main world, and here is one of the possible parallel universes. This is the world where, it, it, the world that you start in is the one where Surge gets attacked by that panther, you know, when he's a kid and he lives. But then there's a parallel universe where he was attacked and he died. And the entire world is different without him being in there. They just boiled it down to just two separate worlds. Bioshock Infinite is like, well, there's like 80 million different Elizabeths. And the, it, it just it collapses on itself so hard and yeah. so fast because yeah. people are confused. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it creates yeah, these, this situation where these like, like really important moments, these really like critical moments in the story become cruxes and like just nobody can really agree on what happened right definitely i don't think you can put such crazy themes like time travel and parallel universes you can't have that be the main show behind the curtain you know like within secret of man i know it's like all right look magic magic is a fucking thing from the get-go right? there's fairies magic gas spells whatever here's the adventure chrono cross okay or chrono trigger you can time travel go through time all right here's the adventure that involves time travel not this going on not playing through the story and then suddenly you know dun, 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 there's parallel universes and time traveling and then you're just, just left like wondering what the fuck did i even just play the game somewhere for? in one of those right that's worlds. exactly what happened with bioshock infinite and it, yeah. it really bothered me because i sat down and i looked at like when i finished the game i sat down and i kind of thought over what happened i was like this is the most pointless experience I've played in a while because that ending technically can't happen. Like, if you're dealing, if you're dealing with, inf with yeah. parallel universes, 
And basically what happens when you're dealing with parallel worlds is every single decision that you make is a branch off into a separate timeline. And that's where the universe has come off of. It's if did you decide to eat, you know, uh, cornflakes this morning or did you eat, uh, I don't know, frosted flakes? And you're just those two separate, those, that decision right there is considered a completely separate timeline. So if we use that example and we look at Bioshock Infinite, essentially what happened is that they're saying that every single decision that Booker DeWitt ever made in his life is a parallel universe. And that also applies to everyone, which means that, well, we have an infinite series of possibilities. But what this also means is that it's impossible to remove every version of Booker DeWitt and Elizabeth from existence like so what if you found four or five or six or seven or however many you found there are always going to be more and in some universe those sequences of events will always occur so you can't just undo it that's the problem it's infinite it has no number it just goes on for eternity yeah and my problem with that game was they had such well Results may vary, but it was an interesting world, and you know they didn't need to bring in this crazy fucking yeah. idea of time travel or parallel universes and stuff. I would have rather Booker Dewitt just been the fucking guy who was hired to do yeah. this shit, not some other person that we don't know anyone anything about until the very end, and then we're just left. Yeah, that's kind of that kind of touches but, yeah. on what the guy in chat, Ill Omen, was saying about how it starts off with all these like social themes and of like racism and revolution and stuff like that and then just switches gears and goes nuts like halfway through the game or a little further right i agree and i think they could have solved that problem just the plot problem by going with the chrono cross method boil it down to one parallel universe that's it boom be done with it like and that way, it would give people resolution at the end, but the end just left people confused, as in, what the hell did I just play? And what about the Vox Populi? And what about the racism and all that? Like, they started touching on that and started making social commentary, but then they left that social commentary behind in favor of the most confusing narrative mechanic in existence. Yeah. This is this is a little off topic, but it's kind of in the same vein. Did you ever see the movie Primer, did. Uh, Oliver? How'd you feel Basically about that? the same thing. It got really confusing towards the end, but damn, if it wasn't intriguing as hell. Yeah, that's kind of how I felt. I, it was just like if it wasn't for the narrator, that movie would be like near incomprehensible. Pretty much, yeah. You know, same thing. Just as you were saying, off topic but related. Um, it's kind of like dealing with Donnie Darko. Like, there are many people who don't understand what the hell happened in that in that movie. And it's not because it's not able to be understood. It's because they had to present the story through the eyes of someone who's a, 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 a questionable, unreliable character. Actually, several. Like, you've got Donnie. He's unreliable because yeah. he's, he's got some mental issues. And then you've got, uh, uh, what was her name? Roberta, the, uh, the nun that wrote the... The, the time travel book, and it's all kind of weird sounding, so it's kind of hard for people to grasp that. And that's why you have to be careful when you're dealing with time travel and when you're dealing with parallel worlds and stuff, because it's such a complex concept that you will lose people so freaking fast. Like, yeah. the only way to do it well. Right, don't lose your story. Yeah. That's all that it comes down don't to. Don't lose your story. Like, uh, uh, here's a, a way that it was done well. Twelve Monkeys. Like, it's pretty clear, same thing, they say, we're not going to tell you how this works, it's mm. just know that a dude gets in a machine, he gets in a thing, and he's going back in time, and he's, a f he's unknowingly affecting the very future that he was sent back to prevent. And they did a really, really good job of just wrapping all that together and just keeping the narrative going just right for the average person. Yeah. God, I haven't thought about 12 Monkeys in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, as for games that I thought had a great narrative, um, I enjoyed reading Historia recently. It's kind of a hidden gem. It was very uh, similar to Chrono Trigger, but it focused more on two parallel storylines as opposed to traveling through time. And I enjoyed the main character. I thought it was just a very lighthearted, fun, enjoyable game. 
definitely a game I'd recommend to anyone new to RPGs what was for the sure. Other? Uh, Radiant Historia. You no, know, it's for the on, DS. On this topic of of time travel, and you're talking about just is stories doing yeah. things well. Here's a great example of time travel um, that occurred in a game. Most people don't even realize it, but time travel absolutely occurred in Skyrim. You guys know that, right? Um, okay. Well, oh boy. Uh, I never played uh, don't Skyrim. Worry. It's not, it's not too much to around, thankfully, but um, you can spoil it. I don't give a damn. Basically, what ends up happening, like when you're dealing with time travel, there's it's not just sending people back in time. Like information travels to and fro in time, and it's it's just funny that we're on this because, like, seriously, I studied the crap out of out of time travel and how to make that work in narrative. Um, the the great thing about Skyrim is that there comes a point where the the titular uh, Elder Scroll comes into play. You get your hands on it. And you're trying to, you know, figure out how to, well, stop the, you know, stop the dragons from, in and, and all doing, messing everything up. And so the player is able to actually open the Elder Scroll and look. And what it does is it allows them to look back in time and see that previous war and learn the dragon shout that was used to, you know, cripple the dragons. And so even though the character doesn't actually travel in time, it was information <laughs> and learning the words from, you know, being able to use that window, and then they brought that back into the future with them. And so that's a really cool way to do it without having people, like, get their mind all confused. Just, yeah, it's yeah. like, hey, here's this thing. You are able to open a window and look into the past, and even though you can't affect it, you can see the things that happen and take advantage of that information that was previously lost. Yep, yeah, um, Dark Souls 2 kind of did a similar thing where you went back to the war between the giants and the human right. beings. I thought that was, uh, those were yeah. some of my favorite parts of Dark Souls um, 2, was going back there and talking to that one guard captain after, you know, earlier I'd gotten his armor and stuff. It was, it was really uh, uh And you reminded me, as, as, much, as many things as I did have, have a problem with in the game, uh, Skyward Sword actually covered this a little bit. There was the, there was the desert level, and... There was a segment in there where you got the option to manipulate time, and in the past, that uh, that place was like lush and it was like a sea, but in the present day, it was a desert, and you got an you got an item that allowed you to like ride a boat through the desert because the little bit that you were inside was ocean, and that was just that was really interesting. Here's a kind of in a similar vein to what you're saying about Skyrim. Hell. Yeah, I mean, I can't believe that was actually material. brought up the probably most well-known time travel, like more so than Chrono Trigger, just as far as people touched in, people who can relate. I mean, why are we not talking about Ocarina of Time? No, yeah, oh. <laughs> that's true. And again, in Ocarina of Time, it was uh, it was very simple, you know. Time travel was cool. It wasn't, it was, you were introduced to it relatively early. It wasn't, you know, behind the curtain at the end of the game. And it was simple. It was like, all right, look, the future's fucked up, but you can save it in the past. It's like, okay, sweet. My 12 year old mind understands yeah. this. I'm going to go yeah, on an it's, adventure. It's now. interesting. And yeah, it's it interesting awesome. in that, that they, they managed to, to create more than, more than uh, two different timelines. And even more importantly, not I think, get lost in the process. With that, is that even if you didn't fully grasp the idea of time travel, you just know I can go from being a kid to being an adult, and there's things that can happen. It's it was so accessible to everyone. You could go, I did it. I I beat Ganon. I saved the future. But if you're someone who's like more complex and thinking about that mm -hmm. stuff, like you realize that the plot of Ocarina of Time is kind of fucked. Like, you didn't fix anything. In fact, it was the worst thing that could ever happen. Like, th yeah. yeah, this is a, a spoiler that's over a decade old, so if you don't understand it, like, for anyone listening, like, well, you're about to get spoiled for Ocarina of Time, but essentially what ends up happening when all is said and done, and Zelda, you know, takes the Ocarina back and she sends Link back to the past, she sent him right back to the moment in time in which Ganon was having his meeting with the king, which means nothing was fixed like if they didn't kill him in the past it didn't matter for anything so the the events of ocarina of time which are, are basically yeah. they're doomed to repeat themselves on a loop unless somebody does something about it right 
Yeah. Yeah, but it felt like we had accomplished something. And I think that's a really important thing when we're talking about the differences between Chrono Trigger, Ocarina of Time versus Bioshock Infinite. And there's this idea that the time traveling is in our hands. It's not some uh, other element that is just in the game that we're trying to understand and control. It's, you know, for right. the other games like Ocarina of Time and Chrono Trigger, you have control of it. Yeah. And it feels awesome. You know, when I play a fucking yeah, song and, and, and I travel through goddamn into time, I'm like, holy well, shit, this is amazing. It's got the Groundhog Day yeah, effect. And... Like, it's fantastic. Yeah. And I think um, I think in the case of going back in, like, when you get sent back in Zelda, there, especially with, with uh, when Majora's Mask came into it, I, I think it was uh, heavily implied that they, they were able to better address the Ganon threat with our knowledge, essentially. We'll yes. never know. Well, we, I mean, we do know we because hope so. uh, he was able to go off on a different adventure in Majora's right. Mask. So you've and got that's that directly kind of, following got kind the of a story of split. Oh, crap, we've wandered into parallel universes yeah. again. I, like, it, it's weird. And the, the most important thing about how Nintendo yeah. went about doing that was don't think so hard about it, just enjoy it. Yeah. Yep, and I think that's the thing no. to take away from it. Do uh, you want to talk uh, about something else? You, is there still more to be said about this uh, element, how this element of storytelling that is present in gameplay game. perspective? Um, I guess to kind of you know wrap it on into our overall conversation is that when you when we look at this, how you handle time travel in a video game is completely different than just how you write it out and just tell a, a, a you tell the story through a book or you do it through film. Like, there are all these different problems that come up, and it's really interesting just to watch game designers try to incorporate it as a game mechanic, as well as a storytelling mechanic, and hoping that the two don't accidentally bump heads and make a hot mess. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely fun to play around with. All right, there's another subject I wanted to get to. That you kind of touched on when you were mentioning Chrono in the with Chrono Trigger, and that is the uh, what do you guys think about the blank slate character? Uh, examples of this would be Gordon Freeman, Chrono, it's a silent protagonist. The argument being that you're supposed to insert yourself into the character. Do you guys buy this or what? Um. Well, I know specifically in the case. <laughs> This isn't really going to answer the question, but I know specifically in the case of Half Life, I kind of wish I knew more about Gordon. Yeah, like kind I, of a I, lot. I do think that it's problematic, just as he said. Um, like Gordon Freeman yeah. is is someone who is clearly established. He has a history. He's a scientist. He works at this place. He's chosen to have you know that fabulous uh, beard. You know, like. He, he's a person, and so I think that this storytelling-wise, because he's been so fleshed out, he kind of got to go ahead and just tell us his story rather than treating us as Gordon. Yeah, I kind of want to know why Alex has got the hots for him so bad. Um... But in, yeah, for real. I want to know what happens but, next. Uh, in cases of, of like RPGs, and, and the, mo the most present one in my mind, because it's the, the one I most recently played in Dragon Age Origins, it, it works because it's, you kind of get to decide every aspect of your character. Yeah, but you're still actually communicating. You don't hear, you don't have, you may not have a voice attached yeah. to it, but you get to communicate oh, okay. with other people, you get to choose the well, dialogue. Yeah. But it's still more or less a blank set. Like you get to you get to choose what you you do and go through. Yeah, but I guess I'm more focused on Gordon Freeman. Like, is Gordon Freeman a good character? Is the argument? There's a lot of people that will say, yeah, you know, he's a great character. But is there actually a character to him, or is could you just replace him with anybody? And because he doesn't really say anything, I don't. Think, you know what I, I mean? Don't think Gordon Freeman is replaceable. Um, I don't think Gordon Freeman is uh, a particularly great character, but I do like him. Yeah, I like him, but I'm I'm a great side. I don't think he's a great character because to me, no. This is no really an interesting question. Like once you kind of like flesh that out a little bit, and you're basically saying 
you're like, what do we, what do we think of the characters who are like clearly built and defined, not create a character, things like that, where you do that and, and you have your own dialogue or things like that, but things like uh, the Persona series where you've got this identity, but you're a silent pro tag and you make, you know, little choices here or there. Um, I think that they're kind of problematic in that usually what ends up happening with these, with these games where they make a character like that and it's, they, they want you to fill the space as far as filling in their personality. Um, it's, it ends up being problematic because usually you see these guys kind of come back and make additional works based around those characters. Like, take a look at uh, Persona 3. Like, the character had no name at, at, at all. Like, that was on you. It's just, the, boom, they gave you a body and you kind of go off and do whatever with him. But then they turn around and they make a manga or they make an anime and they're like, well, crap, we got to actually give this guy a name and give him a personality and all that. And so it sucks because people build up this, this yeah. sense of expectations or they internalize and think about who is this character? What does he represent and things like that? And then it can break that illusion for the end user. Mm-hmm. And definitely, you know, in my game, I romance this character, but in the manga, yeah. it's someone else. Um, but no, in, I, in I the case of in the case of what's Pers- that word? I, I do agree with with everything that you're saying right now. But I think in the case of Persona Four and when it transitioned into an anime, the things they did, I never finished the series. Um, never, never crazy interested in it, but I did. I did watch some of it. The things they did to the main character in the anime were really kind of funny because they took the things like common with the with the 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 typical like blank slate character and kind of like incorporated incorporated them into his character in like a oh, tongue in cheek yeah. sort of way and it made for some really funny moments in the show. Yep, I mean at the same time they yeah, they, had they had to, to do something. It's yeah. it was something they had to do. It, though it would be interesting to see them uh try and approach it and keep it you know, how it was in the game, keep them silent and stuff. I think it would be entertaining, but you know, at what sacrifice to the narrative yeah. itself. Yeah, I would, um, yeah, I would, I, 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 I do personally think that, that most of those blank slate characters don't really have a place outside of games where you can just create one. Oh, definitely. Do you, do you guys prefer playing a, kind of a blank slate character or make your own character, or would you rather be a character that has a voice, you know, literally, or has an agenda of sorts. Or goal, I guess I should say. Um, I guess I'll go. Um, I, I personally prefer to uh, get inside the mind of a character that's already there. I'm not particularly enamored with just, like, creating my own role in a universe. I like following whoever's there and understanding their motivations and why they're the protagonist. Yeah, it's basically kind of like a, what he said there. It really does depend on what kind of mood you're in. Uh, if you sit down and you play Dragon Age and you know you, you go through character creation and all that and you get to decide what kind of a person is your Grey Warden? Who, what do they stand for? What do they represent? And how do they go about solving problems? And everyone else has to react to what you're doing. Now, of course, it's still kind of on a set path. It's just you have more freedom in how you're going to get there. But at the same time, sometimes I just I want to sit down and tell me the story of someone's life. And even though I'm controlling them to a point, it's I'm. It feels more like you're someone sitting on their shoulder and you're observing them and, you know, kind of like Jiminy Cricket or whatever it, with those types of games. And you're just kind of hanging out. And you're like, oh, wow, like you got a messed up life, man. Like, and you can <laughs> you can develop a, a empathy towards that character. You're like, man, this guy's life sucks. I hope you get through that. Like, you're kind of there. So it depends on what you're looking for. If you're will, if you want to be invested in the world or if you want to observe the world. Yeah, that's a very okay. interesting distinction. And I appreciate that. You don't, and I I agree with that. You don't think that you can become what's I mean, up? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you meant it like that, but uh, I don't know. I feel like you can you can become. It's okay. I, I, yeah, I feel like yeah. you can become emotionally invested in the world that you're just observing. Yeah, you're watching other characters, and you know yeah. I can have empathy. That's why yeah, I, I don't mean, think you. Let's put it this way: like when I say that that empathy. Oh yeah. 
in, in the observable world. I mean, it's kind of like how people sit down and watch Lord of the Rings or read Lord of the Rings, and they're like, you know, people care about Middle Earth. We know Middle Earth is not real, but if the character is, has come to life in such a cool way, like that distinction becomes blurred for some people. Uh, just as a, as a writer, as a storyteller, if I can get you, the consumer, to... And, you know, in the back of your mind, believe that this person could feasibly exist. And you're like, man, I'm watching all this stuff happen to them. That means we've done our job right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's right. Goal. And uh, as a writer, I, I assume it's yours as well. Oh, yes. Right. Um, I'm of the camp that I would much rather have a. I would take the role of a character who has a voice and a personality that's already made. But if it's, you know, I like creating my own character, don't get me wrong. There's plenty of games that have character creation that I enjoy. But I will say that if it's a very safe main character, very Mary yeah. Sue or John yeah, Doe-ish, it really does. It, I, it just I would rather comes be a back slate, to I think, at that point. the game that mm -hmm. we're playing and how are you going about telling your story? And that's kind of it. It's like... You know, I just brought up Dragon Age or Skyrim, just all of tests or whatever. But then you sit down and you play something like Assassin's Creed, and, you know, you're like, man, Altair sounds like kind of a dick. I want to find out why this guy's an ass, like, and just kind of get through the story and rather to observe and just be like, huh, that was really interesting. Like, there are plenty of games where that's usually the best option to go with. And, you know, and it, it really, really depends on how they want you to... Um, as you're playing, just become involved in the story. Like, Far Cry 3 ruffled some people's feathers or whatever. Like, they're like, oh, it's more about, you know, privileged white kids having fun or some stuff like that. I didn't particularly care. I was just like, okay. You know, you get in there and it's clear that the main character, Jason Brody, has his own life and he's got this backstory, but then they drop you into it as a the same thing a silent protagonist of sorts not quite but i i think you kind of get what i mean like you run around the world and you're doing stuff but then jason kind of you know pipes up his opinion every now and again which is kind of weird for you know a first person shooter right um just going a little bit a different direction uh, an interesting case that I'm think I'm thinking of here. If I don't know if either of you have played uh, Kentucky Route Zero, but something interesting yeah. about the, the the main character in that one is that it he's more or less an established person. Like he you 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 understand who he is. He drives an antique truck and he's looking for the zero. Uh, and many many aspects of his his past that come up are kind of fixed like there's 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 some implications of like alcohol problems but a lot of the uh circumstances surrounding those problems are up to the player to determine like there's a set of like three or four different options and you get to pick like oh my wife left me or oh i got stuck at a job and it led me to this it's just kind of an interesting way of looking at it and, and presenting that and yeah presenting that. mass effect did something similar right where uh you're a hero for a certain reason or something like that and some characters do bring that up mm, yeah you, you, yeah yeah i guess so they they all got you yeah it's not as major but and i think mass effect one in particular i didn't play two or three but i think that was a great uh mix between having a slate and having an actual character you know i chose what he wanted to say but at the same time i felt pretty strongly that commander shepherd was a character I don't know that. I don't know that I necessarily you can agree. I mean, certain, certain, like, yeah, his his behavior was consistent depending on what choices you made. But I don't know. I just, I didn't, I didn't feel. It's hard to 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 articulate, but I didn't really find command. Yeah, I didn't find you anything didn't connect really there connect, to connect with other than that he's just like a war hero. And he's been thrust into this uh, intergalactic conspiracy. Yeah, it was, he's definitely overshadowed by the world itself and the other characters, and the atmosphere. But I, I thought he did. Yeah, and the other characters. But you know, he held his part. 
He d- it was better as a step above him not oh, saying not, anything not to me. Not really in particular with yeah. Mass Effect. I, I, I don't have anything to say about that, that Three Dog. All right, that's fine. Well, let's bring it to something else. What kind of um, what atmosphere do you guys or genre, I guess you could say, of stories you enjoy the most? Do you prefer sci-fi or something more realistic or something fantastical? And I know that we all play different types of games, but you know, if you had to pick one story, well, I guess that I would you particularly have to enjoyed in the video as game, being as, one as setting, old as I am, I am just kind of immediately biased towards fantasy games just because well you know i grew up in the 80s so that was where most of the rpgs were headed um i do enjoy the modern day setting though uh of persona more than anything else and just uh shin megami tensei in general i love that they you know just they bring us into the present day and they make it more accessible for people who typically don't play RPGs because you know some people are just kind of put off by the sword and sorcery feel of things but uh with that with that series and other games like it that do just modern day stuff like the world ends with you and so on and so forth or even uh Castlevania uh Aria of Sorrow they just they they put things that people know and can directly relate to with that Yeah, I'm. I'm more interested yeah. in in the either the the fantasy settings or, or modern day. I'd like to see more modern day RPGs. Uh, I think it really worked well in the Persona series. I'd like to see a little more uh, conventional, or not conventional, but uh, just yeah. more uh, modern setting in RPGs. I, I went in a circle there. Uh, you made me think of one here recently. Or it came out last year, and I, I keep pointing out all these indie games, but uh, this game that came out last summer, Anodyne, kind of mixed. It, it was a Zelda like, like an old like an old Zelda game, uh, and it it kind of mixed fantasy, uh, uh, a fantasy setting with a modern setting, and it, it was just it, you ended up coming up with all these different instances of just like be a person and a place having like a double meaning, and it was kind of interesting. It's a small game. You know, short, and, uh, and following up on that, that kind of modern day thing, I think that was one of the things that made Final Fantasy VII so successful um, in the West, anyway, is because they took Final Fantasy in a direction that nobody really expected. They were like, yeah, there's technology, there's guns, right? And people were like, whoa, holy crap, what is this? And so for an American audience, they were just like, yeah, I can get behind yeah, that idea. Fantasy. I think that's kind of why they've headed more and more and more towards that di- direction and have gotten away from much of the classic high fantasy. I mean, you you sit down and even look at Final Fantasy X, you know, they made their boom, they finally made their jump into full voice acting and all that stuff. Even then, it was very modernized technology, even if it was, you know, uh, fictional versions of technology, but the concepts are still the same. Or you look at Final Fantasy XIII, which, oh, I, don't get me started on that, but same thing, current current or future tech. And, uh, God, I think Final Fantasy uh, XV is going to blow people out of the water. When you're sitting down and you're playing a Final Fantasy that uses, what for the most part, regular-looking cars, regular-looking clothes, typical haircuts, all of that stuff. I think that Final Fantasy 15 might be the Final Fantasy that saves that uh, that franchise, just because I think they went back to drawing board and took it back to the same kind of level as Final Fantasy 7. Common stuff that people are familiar with. We can only hope. Yeah, I'm. I'm hoping that Final Fantasy 15 yeah. is like a modern themed Final Fantasy V myself. I think that would I just be wanna, a fantastic not adventure. Not to poke fun, but I just want to clarify. <laughs> they're, they're normal haircuts if you get your haircuts out of a magazine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely. Um, I'm of the same camp as you guys. I mean, I, you know, I grew up on fantasy stories and stuff, and I enjoy that. 
it is uh, a little overdone these days, and it can be kind of hard to find a really good one, personally. Um, I definitely enjoy when there's some element of sci-fi to games. Well, maybe not sci-fi necessarily, but modern, a little bit uh, ahead of modern. I'm so freaking kind of mad. Like, I'm uh, still waiting to play it. I just haven't gotten did around to play picking Soul it Hackers up yet. The DS I... or uh, its original release. Yeah, I have it sitting. I have it oh sitting my on gosh. my shelf. I haven't gotten around to it. There's a lot of handheld games that I have not gotten around to that are just sitting on my shelf. Soul Hackers is that. That's one I really enjoy. Very modern, but there's a lot of very interesting uh, fantasy elements. Yeah, absolutely. I won't spoil anything, but you guys should get on that. Do you guys want to take some questions if, from the stream? If people are interested in what I have to say. All right. <laughs> they are. 43 people at least are. Uh, Gray Manalore says, moral, so moral choice systems and their effect on a game story, have they done better? I think or that, have they been done well? And can they be... I think that most games so, huh? do moral choices poorly. Um, do you like moral I, I choices in games, like I guess? Record, I think there's only one series that has actually done moral choices, so to speak, well. And that would be just you know, Shin Megami Tensei in general, uh, just, you, the world is not as simple as black and white. Like, I don't know why this yeah. still happens, but there's oftentimes there's a third choice, there's an alternative, or people only kind of, you know, side with one side, not completely, fully, and utterly. Uh, like, let's look at uh, Infamous 1 and 2. Either you could be good or you could be bad. Well, oftentimes people don't just make good or bad decisions. They make a mix of them. Now, you may skew more in one direction, but it's the world just isn't boiled down that easily. There's so many other things you have to take into account. Yeah. Yeah. Although there was one, there was there was one choice. In the oh yeah, yeah, that, that was, was messed up. Yeah, uh, saving the doctors versus Triss. I think it was her name. That one was really difficult, but yeah, I completely agree with you in every other instance. And yeah, it's definitely yeah. it's too. I think I think another but great one. Even though I ultimately didn't care for the game in Mass Effect Two, there was choosing between repro pro reprogramming the Geth and uh, just turning them off. A lot of people talk about this one, but I think that's a good instance of a, of a, of a complex choice because you're choosing between like, killing them and brainwashing them. And the only, the only real point where that falls short is making one where they, they, they substantiate it, making one of them good or bad, which is just kind of lame. Um, but in terms of the actual choices, this is where a little bit of my own weird kind of experience comes into it. Uh, visual novels... Uh, most of them are dating sims, yes, but there are some that cover strange topics, and one I'm going to talk about right now, uh, called Sayana Uda, some people know of it, it's a very, very strange little game, but you're, you, you, you assume this role of this character, uh, uh, play, uh, sorry, you assume this role of this character, Fuminori, and he's got a, like, a debilitating disorder, and it makes his perspective of the world completely completely weird just just gory just strange and it's very short it's just a, it's just you can probably finish it in two hours but the choices that come up in it are just they're, they're disarming because you don't really uh, the, the first one you come to it's there, there's no there's no moral system it's just you know do you you continue on the path that you're going or do you say hey this isn't consistent with reality. We should freaking uh, get out of here. So if you haven't, okay, that's a that's a very strange game, very hard to digest. But you know, I think if you're interested in my like, complex that choices, the, that's that's why. one of the complaints uh, to follow up on that that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, take a look at Fallout Three. Like, Go ahead, there there's the karma system, and, you know, you're running around, and either you're kind of a jerk, or mostly a jerk, or you're kind of good, or you're mostly good, and almost the, the, the vast majority of the decisions that you can make in Fallout 3 could even, you know, arguably be just anywhere on that, that, that scale, you know, 
very gray or, you know, more pushing towards white or things like that. And one of the reasons that, you know, the ending got changed in the DLC is that, you know, they, they push this thing. Yeah, who you are is going to decide so many of your interactions and how people are going to interact with you. And then when the original end of the game came around, they pushed you down into this kind of crappy choice. Like, and people were really, really agitated and upset by that because you set us up you told you know that if for people that that don't remember you know you were going to have to kill yourself in order to to provide you know actual clean usable water to accessible for everyone the water of life and all that and but then you you gave us this character who says yeah i'm completely immune to radiation and then they throw you in this situation where it's like yeah you're gonna have to go in here where this thing is you know just filled with radiation well you're gonna have to die and i'm like wait a minute this guy over here is it'll be fine we can have our cake and we can eat it too but they didn't give us that choice and that made people angry just like with the the mass effect thing people having to make these complex very difficult choices and then you rob them of the reward of following through on those choices <laughs> if I could yeah, definitely interject real quick. Uh, oh, okay. I got a quick question for you, Words. Uh, you only got five seconds to answer. Hollow. So, uh, hollow or Saya? Someone asked. Okay, Hollow. Anyway, what were you going to say? No, that was going to no. answer that question. Uh, okay. All right. Did you have something else to say, Three Dog, or should I tackle this question about uh, no. moral choices? Um, the issue I have with the whole moral choices is... Um, again, it's very black and white, and I really don't enjoy that in games. But the, I think the bigger concern is that there may be moral choices, but there aren't moral paths. And there's a huge technical limitation on this with games. I mean, you think about how much companies are spending on just making the graphics and shit and the levels and how games are now more linear than ever. You know, how are you going to make it so that... Uh, if I decide to go someplace, go to place A or place B, or if I tell one person to go fuck off, you know, how is that going to have an effect later on in the game? That's why I don't think moral choices are really that effective yeah. these days. Um, I think a good example of, of moral choices in a game, uh, if you've played the Witcher series, there's, like, the, the entire game is, like, built on just, deciding what you think the best course of action is and it's it never really indicates whether it was a good or bad decision outside of like the consequences of them and it's never it's never ever just like you really messed up this guy is totally angry at you he's going to remember that um it just the events play out according to what you decide to do and ultimately they don't always have the biggest impact on the, the narrative and that plays to its advantage because it it makes you feel like a small player in a big in a big plot. Definitely. Uh, that was that was a good question. If anyone else has any questions, I'm taking them. Uh, to touch more on this, what kind of uh, what's you guys? Yeah, you got me thinking on that one. Or a notable character. <laughs> Yeah, I know I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, I know it's a it's a tough one to come up with the right off. Yeah, man, you get, you got me thinking. But any Bro. character, you know, I, I would accept. Uh, even uh, for me, I'm like, oh, geez. There's so I many great characters. I got, um, I got, I've got <laughs> one of my, my favorite characters. Um, I can talk about a great favorite. Play, just, he's he's way up there, Joel it. from The Last of Us. What's Holy up? shit! Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Like that was that was characterization done right, in my opinion. Um, just because it was clear he was mm. multi-layered, he's got oh, yeah. a huge past that we don't know about. There's like a 20-year gap or some junk, you know, just dealing with him. And he, he makes it very clear up front that he's not necessarily a good person. It just happens to be he's coincidentally doing something that could be good. You know, it, you know it's like when you, you kind of see him develop over time just in his... Uh, his conversations with Ellie and he's still got those paternal instincts and being a dad and, and all that stuff. 
but at the end of the day, it's still about Joel and Joel making it to the next day. And it's it's very complicated, and it's kind of interesting to watch. One of the reasons that I just loved it was that so we keep having all these discussions about patri- or patriarchy this, feminism that, and all that, but it, it makes me angry because it's so one-sided. It's like, you know, you make a lot of assumptions about what you think men think, and what we you know, treat as our motivations and all this other stuff. And very few games just explore like men's emotional state or how we deal with crises or different things like that. You know, Last of Us sat down and this is a story about a guy at the beginning of essentially a a pandemic. He loses his kid. It doesn't matter if it's a little girl. It doesn't matter if it's a little boy. All we know is that he has no one to help him with this problem, and now his kid's died. And now someone has thrust him into this position where he potentially has to do all that over again and go through that same sense of loss all over again. Like, nobody explores that space. Yeah, yeah, certainly games. I actually was great have to confess yeah. I didn't finish Last of Us because I didn't enjoy the game itself, and that's just with me and Naughty Dog. Um, uh, as far as Joel goes, I, I agree with a lot, a lot of what you're saying, just based on what I, I played of the game. Um, no, it's a Trump thought, uh, What's his name? It was Hater that played him? I thought his yeah. voice acting was really great in that role. You know, and to, to continue on oh, to Troy that Baker, thread, yeah, Troy with Baker. just dealing with you know, men and games and, and stuff like that. That was one of the reasons why I enjoyed uh, Catherine so much. I was like, oh, good. You know, now women gamers will have to sit down and actually, if they're playing this game, they will have to observe how we feel about things and see the different situations and the complications that come along with relationships and, and dealing with that. I mean, it's like we actually, like women think we just sit around you know, beating yeah. our chest or stuff like that. No, it's like we talk about the same crap. We talk about, well, I'm having problems with this, or, you know, C- Catherine's put me in this position where I'm not sure if I'm ready for that level of commitment. Like, just because a guy says, I'm not sure if I'm ready, it doesn't mean he's waffling or anything. It means a guy's actually sitting around thinking about that. He's thinking about his life. He's having discussions with his, you know, his partners in crime. And they're like, man, I don't know. You know, some guys are a little bit more basic and shallow. Some other guys are more complex and different things like that. But it's stuff that's on our mind and it's stuff that we're thinking about. And just because we're not vocalizing it doesn't mean that we're not talking about it or that we don't care about it. It's just we go about we go about it in a different way. And so I really like that exposition of showing, hey, this is what guys are like and they you know did a good job of yeah. showing all those different types of male personalities it wasn't just one boom here's how guys are no it's vincent's got this problem he likes his girl and he he wants to be committed to her to a certain level but she's asking a lot of him and then you've got the 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 little guy what, what was his name toby who's like really naive and he doesn't know what the hell's going on half the time and then you got old uh, you know the old smooth slick rick i can't <laughs> remember the dude with the the black hair and the yeah. brown jacket like, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, you've got the guy who's like, oh, yeah, I totally cheated on my wife. <laughs> like, you've got all this stuff, and Vincent is just kind of yeah. like, everyone's crazy. Yeah, he's like, I'm trying to make sense of yeah, what's going on. Yeah, he's the middle game. Yeah, the my, man, essentially. My, my feelings towards yeah, uh, very, Catherine in particular ahead, was, was very similar. I, I would like to see more... Uh, yeah, I, and I, maybe I'll maybe I'll fucking do it. Uh, I just I want to see more games tackle like social issues in that regard, where it's just like it's presenting the situation. It's not too particularly complex, and they 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 fluff it up with fluff it up up with a little fantastic stuff. Uh, but it really it, it it at the end of the day it 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 paints a picture of a very real situation and puts all these different personalities on display for you to. Uh, um, learn about and understand. There's another word I was thinking. Actual gameplay is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a very down-to-earth game, despite how yeah. crazy fucking weird yeah. the actual That's what like, was so interesting main about game it. was. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a strange mix. It was yeah. two polar opposites, and it was great. It yeah. was, that's, uh, that's you know, so sitting down at that it, bar. At the end of the day, it was, it was just awesome. like, it was, to reiterate, yeah, it was just, it was just 
so much weird about it, but at the end of the day, it was just this little story. Yeah, about, you know, and really like, importantly, the really important part about how that story was told, go with it. I think this is what made it work and made it all click, is that for the audience, you are never judged. Like, you know, how there was the questions after each major section um, as you were climbing. And, you know, you could see the online results of that, and you would, you know, you'd be really surprised at how people actually feel. But at the end of the day, it's not pointing its finger at you going, you're a bad person. It just lays out the complexities and lets the audience decide for themselves. Yeah. And it, it uh, similarly on the note, when, it, when, when tackling the yeah. issues of if, whether it's a good or bad choice, the, it's the sim- there's a similar scale there, but it's not ever labeled good or right. bad. It's like you're contributing to a more orderly situation or a more chaotic one. It was, it was very maturely handled, you know? It clearly wasn't trying to push yeah. one way or the other. It I'd like to see. Very I'd like to see. Uh, I, that's what made it great. Again, I think they get it even better the next time. Um, <laughs> it, it was. Well I know that it was the about, best uh, North American now. launch ever, but overall sales, I have no idea. Okay. Um, Did you think of a character that you really enjoyed, Words? No, I, I have a few. I, I really enjoyed April Ryan. Like I said, it was my favorite game. April Ryan was the main character of The Longest uh, Journey. And she's just this person, very idealistic, very uh, interested in the world around her, uh, uh, very uh, naive in a lot of ways. And she's thrust into this just incredibly complex, like, just uh, conspiracy where she's forced to like juggle the responsibility of like fixing one world and this other one she's never been to that's just complete like fantastical and filled with like monsters and and different races that she can't even comprehend and it's just her growing and then trying to find where she fits into all this and uh i don't want to spoil too much but it just it ends it 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 it, she grows a lot as a person but ends up still floundering as much as she did at the beginning. And I think that's like, I think that, that, that caught a lot of the essence of what being a human being is like, it's just like, yeah, you go along, you, you, you learn new things, you figure out how to tackle situations, but at the end of the day, you're still just trying as best you can. And it's not always working out. Um, Another one, just because yeah. I think he's a fun bastard. I really liked Geralt in the Witcher series. Um, uh, I don't really want to go into that too much. And then uh, I also really enjoyed uh, some people. People have a lot of mixed feelings about Kingdom Hearts, but at least in the first one and then in Chain of Memories, I really, really enjoyed Sora as a character. I I thought it was interesting him just kind of like learning about the world and, and coming of age. I, I'm really into coming of age stories. Um, and it's just, it, it yeah, was, really there was like a lot of, of like beauty too. in the, the metaphor of him growing up and at the same time being like presented with all these like beautiful, wondrous uh, places that can only be given to you in the, the context of like Disney. Yeah. Yeah. That can and only be brought to you by just Disney. His development over the course of that game brought to you by Disney. Was just, so wonderful to me and then finding out what's really most important to him um and that it was just always there and then in in chain of memories there was the interesting aspect of him losing losing his memories and like trying just the struggle of him trying so hard to remember what he cared about so much uh, just really got to me and i i, I really like uh, i did the new sales numbers uh at the end of 2011, they had moved about yeah, that's uh, fine. 500. I mean, people really uh, like the Kingdom Hearts. Units. So, What's up, Redog? Um, from what I read here, they said it was actually the best launch they've ever had for a product. Um, they opened up with a couple hundred thousand, so they did pretty good on it. Hmm. Yeah. It's. That Sweet. would be very, very nice. I'd well, like maybe we'll see a Catherine too then. Yeah. 
Um, as for characters I enjoyed, uh, two games come to mind. They're both strategy RPGs. Strategy RPGs to me is is my favorite genre of game. Um, I think it has. They usually just have great pacing because it's very straightforward. You know, go from one mission to the next. But um, for Final Fantasy Tactics, I I really enjoyed Wegriff. Um, I really like flawed characters, and I really enjoy uh, political stories in games. Even though I hate politics in real life, but you oh, know sure. his downfall and his beliefs like leading to his downfall. Yeah. To me, made him an excellent character. Oh, I that's really blasphemy. enjoyed that. Oh, you have you. you I didn't like you have to play tactics like, like just the like story is whatever. It, it's tight. Like wow, it's is. it's incredible. Um, yeah. what you were talking about when you said flawed characters, that's kind of something that I think we should touch on and uh, dealing with the yeah, uh, Gary it's, Stu it's and good. Mary Sue problem. You know, there's a lot. Oh, oh, it's up to you. You're the host. Mm. All right, There's... we can touch on that later, go for it. or you can go with it now if you want. Oh, uh, I'll just mention my other characters that I enjoyed briefly, and they're kind of the same reason. Um, if anyone played Joan of Arc for the PSP, uh, Joan and I think Leanna was her name. Those are two characters I'd also enjoyed um, for the same reason that their pride more or less got the better of them. Leanna in particular, and I won't spoil anything, but. There's a cutscene in particular. I'm like, wow, you know, the game may not have a really crazy, awesome storyline overall, but this oh, character in this questions. scene like really fucking hit me. But anyway, uh, you wanted to talk about flaws in characters, Three Dog, or do you want to take some questions really quick? It's okay. up to you guys. Okay, well, I'll take these two questions, or this one question. How do you guys feel about Kickstarter success stories like Wasteland and Faster and Light? Do you feel that the rise of crowdfunding slash Patreon and easy to use engines like Unity is a positive or negative? Um, yeah. I know it's not mm. necessarily related to stories no, and games, but I guess we're getting more games that I'll we wouldn't say have I, stories. Or no, them. go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was gonna say I've I think so far Go ahead, words. Uh, as far as games go, not necessarily with other things, but with games I've been personally more disappointed with what I've I've gotten out of Kickstarter. But in concept, I am a huge fan of what Kickstarter offers. I just um I it's opening up the doors to a lot of a lot of things that we haven't been able to see in a long time. Like Wasteland 2 existing, which is just like what? And from from everything I've heard, West, Wasteland 2 is great. I want to pick it up soon. Um uh but I just think it's not quite there yet, if that makes any sense. I just don't think the 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 uh, the games that we're looking for have happened yet. And maybe that's maybe I'm wrong. The Wasteland Wasteland could be awesome, but most of the games that like I, I backed uh, Among the Sleep on there, and while I was I found it interesting, it ultimately was just kind of it wasn't there wasn't much to it. It was just kind of cliche. Um, I think I think there, there I think there was an update to the the terms of service with Kickstarter recently, where they, they made it so they people have to like stay dedicated to yeah. the projects, and that's that's a that's 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 wonderful because I feel like a lot of people got the short end of the stick with the Yogg's Venture thing, and um, then just to touch on Unity, yeah, I big fan of Unity. Uh, it's making what I want to do possible. Uh, not necessarily in my visual novel project, but just going forward and the type of games I want to make in the future, it's going to be my engine of choice. Yeah, uh, basically, basically, uh, Kickstarter is, is obviously open okay. up a lot Did of different you have avenues wanted to say on that for a lot of different, different developers who yeah. so have established stories that they want to continue telling or new people to tell stories that... You know, publishers want to say, whoa, that's not going to move units or whatever. Uh, well, Kickstarter has kind of proven that stuff false. Um, so that's great. But obviously, as we've seen, like you said, with the, you know, Yogg Ventures and all that, there are some pitfalls. Um, so I think that's just kind of something that we're going to have to take with the territory, unfortunately. Like for every, you know, Kickstarter success story, there's going to be at least 10 others that, 
you know, flop or fail or the people take the money and run and all that. And it, it is hard to vet, well, which one's going to be the safe one and which one's the risk? Well, we kind of don't know. But if we can bring back stuff like Wasteland, you know, the that franchise, Brian Fargo, someone who's actually known, not an indie, not a low, you know, not a nobody, and even he can't get a game funded through traditional means. I mean, that's kind of telling of the state of the industry. And we look at stuff like Shadowrun Returns. Like, thank God they brought that back because, yeah, holy crap, it's freaking Shadowrun. But they had to go through that method just to be able to make the damn game that people wanted. So we, we, we've done a good job with Kickstarter by taking some of the strength away from the classic, uh, quote-unquote, so to speak, gatekeepers. But there's, you know, there's inherent risk to it. I think it's okay for us to take that risk, but, you know. It just takes people being more informed and maybe yeah. putting in a couple safeguards. Right, definitely. There needs to be more checks and balances. Uh, anything that's getting more games to absolutely. be made, absolutely. I mean, how can that be bad, I guess? to the consumer, as long as people aren't being, you know, swindled. Uh, Shadowrun, I thought, was an excellent game. Well, I shouldn't say it was an excellent game. I enjoyed it. I'm glad I played it. It's interesting because I felt that... I'm talking about the first Shadowrun. Your mic's uh, queued up, 3 Dog. There you go. It's interesting because the first Shadowrun... The first Shadowrun remake, not the expansion, it had a good story, and I enjoyed it up until the end, but the actual RPG elements fell on their face, if you ask me. Gameplay was fun, but there really wasn't much scavenging or even exploration. It was very linear. Yeah, I was having I a had problem for the I'm glad I bought it and played it. There we go. Yeah, I think you might have been having some mic problems there. That's yeah, a... having... Yes. Oh, that's okay. I, you know, looking at that's games, what I think about Kickstarters. Uh, so you wanted to talk about character flaws and with regards to Mary Sue's and John Doe's uh, so to speak, Right. Like, you know, we've got writing, we've got, uh, you know, graphic novels, we've got comics, we've got film, we've got television, we've got all that. But I would, I would argue that they're the youngest. And, you know, just video game storytelling, although we've seen some fantastic stories in recent years, you know, they've always mostly been kind of sketchy in some regard. Um, the thing is, is that... I, I try to tell people who want to sit down and they want to write and they want to tell a story. They're like, well, I, I kind of want to write a book. Can you look at my stuff? And I go, okay, let me take a look. And people so quickly fall into that Mary Sue, Gary Stu trap. I mean, if anyone did any like role playing on AOL chat rooms or whatever back in the day, like that was just hell on earth as far as character development and designs went. Yeah. The thing is, like, when I sit down and I have to create these characters, you know, for my works, I always, always, always start with asking the question of, what the fuck is wrong with this person? Because <laughs> people are like, well, what do you mean? No, I want to make a character that does that. I, I you know, I have to tell you, uh, it's not going to work. No yeah. one's going to believe it. And they say, why? Well, how human beings work is that we're all born and... It's not apparent at yeah. first, you know, you grow up and all that, and then you start finding the defects or the, the different things, just situations or experiences that a person has. And those are the things that end up tempering the type of person you are and how you react to things and how you respond to the world around you. It's really, really, really easy to create believable characters when you start with their flaws and then write the, re the reaction of those characters to those flaws. Uh, for example, uh, you know, I, I give some lectures every now and again on how to, you know, just develop your story and things like that. And the question that I pose to people, I say, tell, I'm like, you're going to write, you, you know, you're going to write down a character. They're like, okay. And I said, here's your flaw. Tell me how this person responds to it and how it affects their life. I said, the flaw is that the person that you're, you're creating right now has a sleeping disorder. They, you know, they can't sleep at night. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, that's it. Go, go develop the rest of your character based around that problem. And that's when you actually start seeing people come up with all these different things. It's like, well, uh, 
if you're if you've got a sleeping problem, then you're going to be generally irritable because you're not ever rested, or your relationships are going to suffer because you may become forgetful, or if they don't sleep at night, they can sleep a little bit during the day. Well, they might fall asleep at work, and then that's going to create problems with being employed. Like you can really just blow off, you know, blow up cause and effect once you start working on what is wrong with a person. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, what you've got just to, um, is the best characters that you've seen in he games us back to video are game ultimately characters? flawed video game as stories. hell. Take a look at Solid Snake. What's wrong with Solid Snake? No, if anything, like, okay, so, no, let's go with the perfect thing. You're the clone of the greatest soldier of all time. Okay, so now yeah, he has to perfect. deal with the complex of walking in daddy's big shoes. Um, attachment he's got detachment disorder. And he has to deal with, you know, the pressure that comes with that. And so everyone's got all these big expectations for him. Um, it makes him very isolated. He feels alone in the world. He's just hard to work with because he's naturally a loner in that aspect. Uh, you can, you know, use that idea. Uh, you can deal with characters that have uh, ego issues, right? Like, uh, God, I'm trying to look at my game list here just to think of someone who's just like that. Um, hell, yeah. uh, not even that. Look at Heavy Rain. And I know people are very, you know, divisive on Heavy Rain, but let's look at the main character there, Ethan. Okay, he lost, he, he had this perfect life, and then one of his kids gets killed, and he gets kind of depressed. And he doesn't do a good job of maintaining his relationship with his other kid because he's so focused on this kid that's gone that the, everyone else around him is suffering. He's, you know, still dealing with psychological issues because of that. So it makes him make sketchy decisions and all of that. But he tries to power through that. That's the kind of stuff that we're looking at when we look at games with these pre-made characters that really, uh, it, it's, it's the flavor it's what actually makes us fall in love with a game character. Uh, take a look at, hell, just take a look at uh, Assassin's Creed 3, even though, same thing, not the greatest game in the world, but you've got Connor, and, you know, he's this, you know, half-native, American, half-English guy, and he's got a big-ass chip on his shoulder. He's mad as hell. Like, he's helping with the American Revolution, not because he necessarily wants to see you know, the colonies succeed. It's He's got people to kill because he's pissed off. They've ruined his life. They've taken everything from him that he had. So now he's really angry. You know, you've got to build characters around that concept. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And to echo uh, the snake concept of, you know, doesn't touch much on it in Metal Gear Solid necessarily in terms of you playing it out, but the whole war hero, soldier of fortune kind of mentality, you know, when he speaks to people, he's very blunt, he's very straightforward, and he's slow to make real deep connections right. with people because you never know when you're going to lose him, and he never knows when he's going to die. You know, he's this agent going on these yeah. almost suicidal missions, right? And just to... No, just just to reinforce what what all of so us said gonna... earlier about, yeah, go about what you're saying, character words. development, and it's actually the reason why you won't see much of my own writing out there, because I struggled for a long time with with creating uh, believable characters in my fiction, and I could I could I could notice it. I I and I was just I just agonized over it. And it was it was when I I realized that I needed to focus more on where these characters came from and what their damage was rather than what I wanted them to do when things sort of started happening for me. And just that's just to, to reinforce what he was saying. Yeah, character, if you want a good character, you gotta have flaws with them. But at the same time, don't you know, don't focus the spotlight too much on them or it becomes a trope. Or just it's you know, a very basically, yeah. far as a balance. That's that's how people are gonna be able to go back and, and really determine at least that's how I look at why, it. you know, what kind of good Anything characters else about are flaws see. And characters you, you know, on. Way back when uh, the last generation started, um, I started off I first got introduced 
through the 360, like that's when I made the leap, and I had to get on Dead Rising. And, you know, everyone talks about Frank West. They talk about Frank West. My wife sat down and asked me, and she said, why is he, why do you think he's great? He doesn't look like anyone special. And I had to be blunt, but I said, he's special because he's not special. I said, he is unattractive. He's got that big bulbous nose. He's kind of got a pudgy stomach. Like, he, he, he looks more like a linebacker than an action hero. He's so mundane, but yet he's in there kicking ass and taking names and, you know, thumping undead skulls. And because he's not attractive, because he's just this guy, he covers wars, you know, it really caught people's attention. It's, it's out of character. It's a... Uh, it goes against the general MO of video games entirely, and so I think that's one of the reasons that he resonated with people. If he was some kind of dashing, rugged-looking hero, I don't think people would care about him as much, and that's kind of proven with Dead Rising 2. Like, the, the main character that Chuck Green, you know, pretty, you know, not very fancy name, but he was a hell of a lot better looking, so to speak, um, than Frank was. But that also robbed him of character. And so nobody's all like, yeah, hell yeah, Chuck Green. No, everyone's still talking about Frank West. Yeah, and just in the, the case of, of Frank West specifically, I didn't play the second Dead Rising, yeah. but I think had Frank West been uh, a more conventional like uh, main character for the video game, I think yeah. he would have contrasted really poorly with, with a lot of the other events of that game. It's just like, oh, you, you know what I mean? I'm, yeah. I'm good. Definitely. Uh, how are you guys for time? I actually could use a break if we could take like a five or something. I actually okay. could use a break. Yeah, we can take a five minute break. Um, we're going to take a five minute break, everybody. We'll be back and we'll keep talking. We'll, when we get back, we'll talk about uh, Eastern versus Western game design, Fantastic. stories, RPGs, and uh, yeah, let's break and let's get back at uh, it'll be nine forty east of my time. And if you guys want to bring in some more people, I'd appreciate it. All right, see you guys.